evening from New York. As often seems to happen in the late afternoon of summer Fridays, two lingering mysteries of Bush administration misdeeds have been definitively solved in our fifth story in the countdown. One, how intelligence was manipulated in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks. And two, who it was who called John Ashcroft as attorney general as he was recovering in the intensive care unit of a Washington, D.C. hospital, orchestrating the failed attempt to get him to reauthorize the government's spy program. This hint, if you answered vice President President Cheney, you did not aim high enough this time. A new internal government report revealing that President Bush himself tried to subvert the authority of his own attorney general, directly ordering the infamous expedition to the hospital bed of Mr. Ashcroft to strong arm the ailing attorney general and the deputy that was then serving as the acting attorney general into renewing a surveillance program that would lapse in a matter of days. Having waited until his attorney general had just come out of surgery to do this, having waited until his attorney general's wife had refused to put him on the phone when the president called. Quoting from page 24 of the report today, on March 10, 2004, President Bush instructed him, then White House Counsel Alberto Gonzalez, and Chief of Staff Andrew Card to go to the George Washington University Hospital to speak to Ashcroft. Card called the hospital and spoke with an agent in Ashcroft's security detail. Ashcroft's wife told the agent Ashcroft would not accept the call. However, at 6.45 p.m., Card and the president called the hospital and, according to the agent's notes, insisted on speaking with Ashcroft. Mrs. Ashcroft took the call and was informed that Gonzalez and Card were coming to the hospital to see Ashcroft regarding a matter involving national security. You will recall that two years ago, that former Deputy Attorney General James Comey finished the rest of the story in gripping Senate testimony, recounting that Ashcroft still shot down the president's entreaties in spite of being in a weak and drugged up state. Two days later, President Bush was asked about his role in the bedside drama by our own Kelly O'Donnell. Sir, did you send your then chief of staff and White House counsel to the bedside of John Ashcroft while he was ill to get him to approve that program? And do you believe that kind of conduct from White House officials is appropriate? Uh, Kelly, there's a lot of speculation about what happened and what didn't happen. I'm not going to talk about it. It's a very sensitive program. I will tell you, however, that the program is necessary. Was it on your order, sir? So I said, I, this program is a necessary program that... Uh, was constantly reviewed and constantly briefed to the Congress. It's an important part of protecting the United States. George Bush's officially confirmed deception was not just by omission, but also by commission. The report prepared at the request of Congress also revealing that in the days after the 9-11 attacks, the president authorized secret surveillance activities beyond controversial warrantless wiretapping, activities which have still not been made public. They are referred to in this report as the president's surveillance program. Equally unsettling, the report also stating that an unnamed White House official inserted a paragraph into the first threat assessment prepared by the CIA after the 9-11 attacks, which was then used to justify the extraordinary intelligence matters. Time now to turn to our own political analyst, Richard Wolf. Richard, thanks for your time. Good evening. Good evening, Keith. Uh, President Bush directly ordering, orchestrating the infamous expedition to the hospital bed of Attorney General Ashcroft, long suspected, long reported, now official. Uh, for what might be the first time, the answer to that kind of mystery was confirmed to not be Vice President Cheney. How significant is the official nature of this investigation? Well, I've always thought it was convenient uh, for people to lay all the blame at Dick Cheney's door. Uh, it was convenient for the uh, Bush administration officials because they could paint President Bush as being a good cop to the bad cop of, of Dick Cheney. Convenient for Bush's critics as well because they had someone easy to caricature and, and, and to portray as being uh, unmitigatedly evil. And then you got uh, convenient for Dick Cheney because he could seem scarier than, than reality. And in actual fact, what you have here is a real undermining, not just of the Bush-Cheney dynamic, but the self-image of President Bush, of someone who played by the rules and had a common sense of decency no matter what he was up to. And really this gets to the heart of that. It undermines that self-image because this wasn't just a sort of midnight rush because there was a deadline. This was a well-hashed-out debate where the chief law enforcement officers of this nation said the program was illegal. He was trying to do an end run around the law and there's no two ways about it. it was indecent and, as it happens, illegal. At that news conference, two days after uh, the former Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Comey, revealed the incident, the clip we heard there, the president uh, played coy when asked about it. Uh, is not a lie by omission still a lie? 
Well, I'm not sure that it is, actually. This was the typical kind of dodge that the president would have at the time, and uh, it was obvious what he was dodging. Really, if you listen to that answer, the answer is, uh, well, it was necessary. In fact, anything is necessary, if I say so, because these threats are so dangerous. So really, these legal debates and quibbles you're having are a bit like the uh, Geneva Conventions, some old-fashioned, archaic, academic theory. And that is itself... A revealing insight into his mentality. So I think there's something worse than whether you're lying or being fully truthful or half truthful, and that's whether the president abides by the laws. Yeah, the one other word in there that, that was left out, quaint. Uh, quaint fit into that description of both the, uh, the treaties and the idea of telling the truth to the American public. The, the, this other thing in the report, the unnamed White House official who added a paragraph into the first threat assessment after the 9-11 attacks. He, obviously, he's delivered this thing by the CIA, adds something in it, and then they take that addition, quote it as part of the CIA threat assessment, and use it to, to justify the extraordinary intelligence measures. This looks like, is, is this the, the first time that that pattern was, was used, essentially create the self-fulfilling prophecy and then quote it back to the people who were asking why you're doing this? Well, we don't know what the paragraph really says, but uh, it is extraordinary that you have um, what we assume is a political official adding to the intelligence because presumably they think their analysis is better than what the intelligence officials say it is. And, and again, that, you've got to get back to the sort of psychology of that period. People were afraid, absolutely. It was a terrifying uh, period, and people were rightly scared of, of uh, and, and shocked at what had happened in terms of the 9-11 attack. But to then use that for political purposes, to then say uh, we need to embellish what we think is a serious threat, I think gets to the insecurity those officials had because, remember, it happened on their watch. And I think there was a certain amount of self-defensive uh, rear-end covering that was going on. Speaking of which, what does this president do about all of this now, uh, given the, the, the particulars that are out? What does Obama do about trying to maintain this program while, while trying to suppress the legal challenges against it? Well, this won't satisfy his, his diehard supporters, or at least the people who are the base of the, cons uh, of the, of the Democratic Party, but uh, he has already said that wiretapping was just fine as long as it's not warrantless, as long as there is minimal court supervision. He has clearly said in the campaign and in office that he wants the program to continue, so uh, I, I don't think he cares who started it. He sees a value to it as long as there is this minimal supervision, and for civil liberties people, that really isn't enough. MSNBC's Richard Wolf, as always. Great thanks. Have a great weekend, Richard. Thank you, and you, Keith.